did a podcast with somebody actually talking about JK Rowling this person said to me you need to catch up Dawn people can't be constantly teaching you how to be because this is not okay and you need to catch up you can't know everything you are not allowed to say I don't know anymore I have seen people with a lot of whatever success is feeling spiritually and emotionally bereft that part of their life which looks all marvellous means this part has been neglected much rather live in a awkward bit wrong bit ugly bit didn't feel right got the wrong thing got wore the wrong yeah. clothes uh, it's, it's being truthful. a human hello Dawn French hello how are you Fern Cotton I'm so good I'm so good now this is a wonderful moment for many reasons one of them being you were my first ever guest on Happy Place the podcast was I? you were the first I know that when I was at the beginning I wasn't was I the first to go out? Yeah. Didn't Tom Daly go out? Oh, we don't care about him. Oh, who's he? Whatever. Yes, okay. oh, I think it was... But you were the first I recorded, yeah, without okay. a doubt. I remember. You came all the way down to Cornwall. I did. It was March 2020, uh, 2018, which is six years ago. Oh, my Lord. How? Okay. And I said to you, Dawn, will you come on my podcast? And I think you said... I don't know what that is, but yes, <laughs> can you come to my house? Yeah, as long as you're prepared to travel to me. <laughs> and uh, it was so I lovely. I didn't know what a podcast I was. barely did. Well, you were one of the first to do a podcast and look how successful it's been. Good for you. But th- I have to thank you because having you say yes definitely led to a momentum where other people went, oh, Dawn did it. Yeah, I'll do it. So... Good. Huge thank you. Well, can we be done with the thank yous? And I'd I'd rather have money or <laughs> flowers or chocolates or something, you know, that okay. I can hold. Something okay. I can see. We can we can make that arrangement. <laughs> it will happen. But we've got so we I actually listened back to that episode and we covered all sorts of things, but there's sort of I guess a very specific route I want to take today. Okay. And that is inspired by your brilliant book and your tour. Your book, The Twat Files, which I lolled the whole way through. But there's real beautiful, poignant moments in there as well. But these are moments where you've messed up, like we all have, or things have gone a bit wrong. What was the impetus to make you focus on these moments in your life? You know, like a lot of good things in life, this was a bit of a happy accident because I had done a tour called 30 Million Minutes, which was mainly about my actual life and my family and who made me and all the things I've been through. So it was very personal. Um, And I wanted to go out on tour again. And I thought, right, okay, what have I not talked about? And I thought, well, I haven't talked about any career stuff, work stuff, but then that is really the part of me that has been in the public eye. So why would I be talking about that when people have already witnessed that, if you like? And I thought, well, maybe what people are more interested in is the stories from behind the scenes. Stuff that, you know, how things get to where they do when they're polished. Uh, so I started with that as a thought. And then I started to think of silly times and things that had gone a bit wrong. And that's what amused me. And I thought, well, I'll tell them a few. I'll tell some stories. I mean, I'm not really a stand up, uh, but I am a storyteller. And I thought, well, I can tell stories about times when things have gone a bit wrong. I'll, I'll litter the show with that because that will amuse me and them. Then I started to think more and more, and honestly, the realisation that I've been such a twat for so <laughs> much of my life is a bit humbling <laughs> and, um, and also quite revealing. And I thought, these are the stories that I'm interested in. These are the stories I will enjoy performing for people. So why don't I just write down all the times that I think I've been a bit of a twat um, on stage or, you know, in film or f- TV or whatever, so there were a whole load of those, far loads of those, some that suited the the stage show, but many more that, that, that I decided, well, that there's more that need to go in a book. And also then I thought, what about my actual real life, the moments in my real life where I've made stupid decisions or done a stupid thing? And I thought, yeah, there are loads of these. And the more I thought about it, A, the more I was delighted in it, and B the more I knew that this show was going to be more than I had thought it would be. And I thought it was just going to be some face the front show off and have a laugh kind of show. But actually, the more you talk about mistakes you've made, the more you own it and sort of reshape it, 
into whatever form you want to amuse or to explain or to unburden. All of those things just leave you so free of any of the shame of any of it. And it's delightful. And I thought, blimey, this is something I should have been doing all along. And then I thought, but I have been doing this because this is what I do with my beloveds. This is what we all do. When you see a friend, you don't tell them your marvellous successes, where you've been perfect. Well, I wouldn't with my friends or certainly not with my family. I'd be killed instantly if I was that arrogant. But what you do is you say, you won't, you won't believe what I did. And then you relish the chance to explain what a fool you are. Mm. But you only relish it because you know you're in safe hands. You know you're with beloveds who will enjoy this and who will keep your shame safe and not let it become anything bigger or worse. And what's more, they will also unzip. Yeah. And they will come back with the same stories and trust you. And that's how we communicate with people. I'm not interested in perfect, successful people. I don't believe it for a second. We know this. Oh, it's a load of old bollocks. We know it. We know it more yeah. than we know anything else. So why do we pretend differently? Now, listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't enjoy each other's successes or or we shouldn't be proud of each other or um, celebrate all the great moments. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying the other moments I think might be even more valuable. So much more. So, and like you say, revealing, um, liberating, saying them out loud. It is, of course, a very different thing talking to your beloveds who you know you trust and they trust you if they want to share as well. Yeah. But standing on a stage or writing a book, not knowing who's going to read those stories, did that have a different feeling about it? Well, look, any writing that I do, and, and you know, there, there are probably real thoroughbred proper grown-up serious writers who think differently about this. So you are one of them. Oh, you, uh, well, you're you are more so than them. me. You are also a writer. <clears throat> but, you know, some people could write because they just have to write because it's just absolutely who they are and what they must do to feel creative and whatever. I write so that it lands in someone's eyes, ears, head, heart, wherever it lands. I don't, it has no purpose to me unless it connects with somebody somehow. Now, novels are one way of doing that of immersing yourself in a character, in a story, and, you know, having a purpose to writing a novel. I love that. That's rigorous. But um, non-fiction writing like this also has a place. And so long as it's entertaining, first and foremost, but also has a belly of some kind or a purpose of some kind, then I'm all in for that. And then I'm happy to spend time alone in a room in my head, enjoying, you know, the delights of my own mistakes and my own follies, if you like, because I know it will land. Mm. And the weird thing was, as I was doing the show, as I was doing the show in front of live audience, I hoped that by opening up these silly mistakes, it would be funny for all of us. I, I hoped that. And I thought, well, surely I've got, after all these years, I've got some skills to be able to deliver stories that might be quite funny like this. But what I really felt, and it was a kind of visceral thing in the room, and it pretty much happened every night. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm thanking all the gods of performance <laughs> there. Um, I noted that. <laughs> yes. The praying I'm hands. not thanking you. <laughs> uh, I'm thanking them. Um, but thank you if you were ever <clears throat> in an audience. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, I... I notice that they lean in. There's a kind of moment where you think, yeah, you're with me on this because you too have felt this. I've managed to, by a happy accident, as I say, chance upon something that we all know to be true. Therefore, you're giving me permission to say it and I feel you leaning in. You're not sitting back waiting for me to amuse you with my jester stories. You are joining me because you've done it too and you've felt this way, you've felt this humiliation, you've felt the sting of those tinging moments where it's just awful and you can't take it back and you did it and it's awful. Uh, you too have felt it, but hey, let's try and take the, you know, the, the, the awful fawn out of it. Don't let it be a haunting thing. That's what I think I've felt for a lot of years, more years than I 
care to think or that I wish, you know, like everything growing up, it's about finding these things out, isn't it? Yeah. And growing old is even more about that. I think, God, why have I carried some humiliation about this? I didn't need that. I think we all do. And I think that's why it feels like not only a great source of laughter and entertainment, but a really important book. And, you know, you state, you say in the book, if you shine a light on it, shame, embarrassment, all these ugly feelings, it vanishes. You can flush out the embarrassment by owning it and brightening it up. And I think it's absolutely true, but you still have to have an element of courage or I think there's there's certainly things I was thinking of when I was reading your book like oh I don't know if I would still say this aloud because shame can it's but it breeds in silence and it and it breeds in secrecy those stories get bigger and bolder and have more punch to them when you don't say them aloud yeah and you're giving the power away that's the problem you give the power to the person who's made you feel that or the person who also knows this secret or whatever you give the power away to the mistake yeah i want to have the power of it and i want to really wrestle it to the floor and reshape it and then once once you do honestly it disappears yeah and the other thing that helps and i do mention this in the book and i've thought a lot of about this since it occurred to me um and in fact i could write a whole book about this i think but the power of a proper, authentic apology. Oh, yeah. And any mistake, not purposeful evil, not that, that's unforgivable, but any mistake, an intentional mistake that you make is forgivable if you properly apologise. This is such an interesting one. And Reading that bit of the book, I thought about it a lot because I absolutely agree. And not that long ago, I wrote a letter to someone that I had unintentionally upset. They weren't a great friend, but I knew them and I've always felt bad about it. And did you how did you find out you had upset them? Did it come to you via someone um, else? I I found out they were upset, but also in hindsight I can see that I'd gotten it wrong. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And this was probably, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, long, long time ago. So I think just again with age and experience and my own shortcomings, I can see, wow, okay, I wouldn't act like that now. And I wrote a letter, which I hope they've received, and I don't know what the outcome is. I'm not even expecting one, but the lightness I feel about that situation, which used to really drag me down, is huge. But I wonder if there are exceptions. Do you think there are times when... It's not possible to, to, to say sorry. If you perhaps assume or have a slight intuition that it won't be accepted or you might then open up another can of worms with them being back in your life, do you think there are exceptions? Mm, that's interesting. I suppose you might protect yourself by not apologising to someone you think might come back into your life if that person is toxic or... Uh, difficult for you or whatever but I think I would risk it yeah I don't think I've ever regretted an apology I don't think I've ever regretted one even if it was difficult to do or mm, sometimes you know I have learned this again with age that that kind of apology that isn't real is the one that sounds a bit like I'm sorry that you took it that way Mm. which isn't yeah. an apology, an apology is it no. in fact it's worse yeah it's worse it's i'm sorry you're so dreadful that mm. you do you're so inadequate that you don't know how to <laughs> you know that it's so patronizing that yeah. kind of or even the sarcastic sorry sorry a thousand sorries is that enough how many sorries do you want from me that kind of sorry doesn't do it doesn't cut it at all and yet we somehow have learnt how to be like that I certainly have learnt how to be with a bit of comedy or a bit of um, uh, arrogance maybe Um, learnt to sort of put a bit of a protective cloak around ourselves by spitting out Um, and I think it's to do with being defensive yeah and protecting ourselves more and we live certainly live in a time where we're afraid of what might happen. So even an apology fe- feels like accountability. Does ca- accountability then lead to blame? Does it then lead to even worse stuff? And, you know, this is how we live now, which is just awful. It's toxic. And I, and I, I was wondering how you're feeling about that, because I think the 
margin for error is so tiny now. People have got no tolerance. And this is the interesting thing. They've got no tolerance for anyone, or maybe in the public eye or politics or whatever it is, making a mistake. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that means they've got a very low tolerance for making mistakes themselves. Yeah. Because if you're judging others in that way, surely you're but judging think, yourself it's a in that way. Thing. It is, yeah. It's, it's become a kind of a malaise yeah. in a funny way. And I'm really sad about it. All, my only hope for this, for my own t- kids and stuff, is that this will change because there's nearly always a backlash yeah. to anything like this. And I hope a fresher, more open and inclusive way of thinking. Yeah, we're all talking about inclusivity and, you know, favouring difference and all the rest of it. And that's all great. I, I love the idea of that, but that's not how we're living. Nope. We're living the opposite of that. We're, you know, we're massively intolerant and quick to blame and litigation and f- bullying and trolling and all of this dreadful stuff, which has got nothing to do with understanding how other human beings operate. And yet we are human beings, yeah. most of us. Uh, you know, we, we are people who know we make mistakes. We know, that, you know, that we have shortcomings. We know all this stuff, but because we are expected to present ourselves as perfect, yep, um, and only celebrate all the perfect things, it's just wiped out any, as you say, any margin for error. I am a massive advocate of robust debate, yep, that might change your mind. That's you gone can't. out the window too. What? But that's the best thing in the world. Correct, yeah. That's how we govern, or should. Yeah, yeah. It's not how we govern anymore. But the whole point is, I sit here with you, you have a different opinion to me, you have a different experience to me, and by listening to you, and also knowing, and this is key, knowing that your intent is good. If I suspect your intent is not good, or there's another purpose to your intent... Of course, I'm going to be suspicious. And again, human beings operate on a thousand sophisticated levels. So I'll be feeling a bit of that as you start telling me your opinions. I'll think, oh, she's got another agenda. But if your intent is good and we sit here and you tell me your other opinion or how you came to it, I'm going to understand that. Yeah, and could still happily disagree. Lovely. Could Um, happily disagree or could change my mind and agree. And Mm -hmm. that would be a win Mm -hmm. for both. But it's impossible if what we've got to do is hunker back into our positions, defend them by spitting and being furious and then blaming and cancelling. Yeah. that I don't know how to be like that. And shaming. I think that's become really normal, shaming other humans. And I think we forget how unbelievably dangerous that is for the receiving, the beneficiary of that shame. I think we can remember every time we've been shamed in our lives Agreed. more than probably many other memories. They're and I was thinking, that yeah, stick to us. I was thinking about it reading your book. I remember this really harmless moment, but being probably five or six at, at school and drawing a picture of a house, as I'd been told to do. And my dad, who was a sign writer, used to kind of sketch and use this real sort of wishy-washy way of using his pencil. So I thought, well, I'm just going to copy my dad. He's a professional. And I got so told off and ashamed in front of the class for not colouring it in completely and neatly. And that's something that happened when I was five. We don't forget these moments. No, we don't. And I think that's luckily slowly coming out of the parenting model and the school model. But it hasn't come out of how we're communicating on social media. No, it hasn't. But it, as you have grown through that and remember the sting of that awful moment, you also know now as an adult that that person was wrong to do that to yeah. you. So you might forgive them for it because they were... They got it wrong. And you have to hope with good intent they had some other agenda. They mistook your creativity. They They're having a shit it. day. Having a shit day. Anything. Yeah. Let's forgive that because that can go. But you know as an adult they were wrong. You don't have to carry it as you were wrong. Yeah. It's not your shame to have. No. It's their shame to have. But I think as adults we conflate the two. We don't know what our own opinion is anymore and we actually think the person that shamed us is probably right. And I've definitely felt like that as a grown adult. And I still find that tricky to unpick sometimes. Like, you know, even if you know that your intent was good, but you still got it wrong, which happens all the time for all of us. Our intent's good, but we get it a little bit off. We're not quite sure what we're talking about. But when you've been shamed, I think it's really... It's a really tricky situation. My instinct is to hide, go into my shell. I'm never going to speak again. I don't want to say anything or move into sort of 
scary territory. I think it's a really tricky thing to, to know yourself and go, but I know that, yes, I got it wrong, but I know my intent yeah. was good. Yeah. It's really tricky. You've got to, you've got to have guts to do that. trust each other that that at a, as a base level that your intention is good. Yeah. That's what I would like to believe about yeah. other humans. Same. You, know, do you, you want to believe they meant well, but they got it a bit wrong. Yeah. And that makes it forgivable then. I mean, I I genuinely think we're we're being forced into corners where I can smell my own cowardice. Mm. I don't like that. Yeah, I've, I've never been cowardly. I hope, but I'm starting to be that because I'm being circumspect about what I will support or not, in case it causes trouble. Yeah. You know, and even thinking about the timing of when I might say such a thing or what might be cherry picked out of this and lambasted against me. And yet and that forces us to shut up. I know. And we're not we're not going to shut up. Haven't we lived long enough? As women, especially, yeah, I know. you know, we, we, we that's the last thing we should do is shut up or, you know, put baby in the corner. Yeah, yeah. We shouldn't be back in the corner. And yet I am in the corner and I really dislike it about myself and about this cultural malaise where I just think, oh, I'd like to support that person in what they just said there. Oh, Mm, yeah. that's going to be taken wrong yep. because there's a whole gang of people that don't like this person then I'm going to be in their gang and they won't like me in that gang and and also can I be bothered no. with the huge maelstrom that will come but that means some people who are being brave enough to speak up are alone Yeah, because those of us who might support them can't take on all the problems it might bring what That's a awful. shitty... That's cowardly. ...load of crap we've got ourselves into here. Well, yeah, well, how has it happened? How have people given their lives so that we could vote? How have people done so many things to push forward and now we're in this place? It's, it's horrendous. It's ludicrous. I don't, like you, I don't know how to unpick it. I don't... I also... I remember, I mean, I, you know, I've got a lot of young people in my life and some of the young people in my life are quite... Um, confrontational about exactly these kind of things and I'm up for that I want to know what the thinking is I want to understand and I want to learn um and I want to have my say when I think I I think I've got a handle on it um and be heard um you know in equal time but I remember once I did um well I did a podcast with somebody actually who at the end of the podcast um she said to me something I can't even remember exactly what it was about now but it was something, and it was when we'd finished recording and we were talking about, oh, I, I can't remember. We were talking about some, I think it was, uh, we were talking about J.K. Rowling, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, this person said to me, no, 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 we're not, we're not having any of that. We know we're not associated with that. And I went, oh, OK, because I know J.K. a bit. And I said, um, oh, OK, because, and she said, yeah, because she used this terminology and we're not doing that's unacceptable. I said, oh. Oh, I don't even know that term. What is that? And she went, you need to catch up, Dawn. You need to catch up. We can't, people can't be constantly teaching you how to be because this is not okay and you need to catch up. And I left that, I, I left it all thinking, oh, okay, do I need to catch up? Is that right? I do need to catch up and that is true. But I also need to be taught. I need to learn. And also we it's, can't know everything. There's loads know of everything. things. There's loads of moments where I go, oh, can you... I don't I don't know. And it, that's become another thing. It's almost like you you are not allowed to say I don't know anymore. I don't know about this subject. I, I don't, don't know. We're not exactly. allowed to say it. I d I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yet yeah, it's very powerful to say that, especially when you don't know. Yeah, That's completely. better than pretending you do know. Completely. And it's certainly better than forming an opinion about something you don't know. I know. And I'm just saying, please, especially you younger folk, please inform me. And explain this to me so that I can understand it and not make this mistake again. But don't tell me to catch up. No, no. I'm Do you know what? There's On the JK um, Rowling note, there's the most brilliant podcast on everything we're talking about called JK Rowling, The Witch Trials. I've heard it. It's wonderful. It's one of the best podcasts I've it's ever wonderful. listened to it's so, in cause my also, life. It's JK balanced. is her, her feet are held to the fire. Yeah. And because the woman, I can't remember her name. I know, she's a fantastic, fantastic you know speaker. That she is the the woman who presents it, 
was one of the reasons she's brilliant for this is because she understands hate. Yep, she was because in the. She was part of the Westboro. That's it, Westboro mm, Church. Yeah. The Methodist or something. Yeah, Baptist, yeah. Baptist, whatever it was. Baptist Church. Who were the most hated family that Louis Theroux yes. interviewed, didn't he? And I was surprised when I realised that's who it was. And I thought, of course she's the right person for this because she's been loathed. Yeah, but and she also knows that she got it wrong, that she was she wrong in her views before, and she's extremely explicit in saying that she without is. any shame. She is. She's like, I, I got it wrong. She is, and she and she wants to understand how it happened. She places everything in context yeah. in terms of history, yeah. what was going on in our world, what, you know, who the loudest, shiniest, loudest, um, most colourful voices are, which happened to be JK at a particular time, who made her mistakes, but who is also a very good person uh, with a remarkable history of all kinds of things and has paid a huge price and whatever. And part of me thinks this is the exact situation where robust debate yeah. would help us all. Which I think that podcast is because you've got every corner of the spectrum covered in terms of different voices and people coming on to have their say, as well as JK. And I thought yeah. it was so balanced and there was no narrative forced upon you. No. I think everybody who listened to that whole series came away going... Wow, I've got I've got a lot to think about, and actually, I'm still not sure. Yeah, and I'm kind of mulling it all over. Yeah, and that and you rarely can still happens. Take offence, and yeah. you can still be outraged. Yeah, and you can, but at least you've had lots more facts than yeah. you ever did. I, I agree with you. That is a terrific podcast. But that's what that's a really good example of how we should be talking about everything. Agree. Just all discussing everything with the anger taken out, because I didn't feel like any of those voices or contributors came at it with anger. Yeah. They were all really up for having a proper good debate yeah. and also talking about their personal stories, their lived experience. And, you know, I, I love listening to other people's stories. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother doing this podcast. But there's only so much, I guess, you can take from that. I don't have the, I don't have your lived experience. I don't have last week's guest lived experience. Yeah. But I'll listen and I'll yeah. learn. Yeah. And that's all we can do. It there, is. there is a cap to that where we go. That that's all I can do is listen and learn. Agreed. I can't feel those feelings or embody it. And I think we're in such a muddle with all of that. We we're are in such I mean, a muddle with it. I think it. one of the things we might have to understand a bit more is that not everybody comes at something from the same place obviously but we don't start on evil uh, level playing ground we don't no i remember back in the 80s when jennifer and i were just starting you know and there were no women really there had been oh, wooden walters were around a bit and there'd been some women you know back in the 50s who'd done a few things but it's honestly finger of the fingers of one hand that you could count on um and what i remember being and i think this is a little bit of a repeat of that is being massively offended and angry at anything guys said about women in comedy. Furious about it all. I remember somebody asking me, you know, and it was a righteous anger in a way, somebody, or rightful anger, maybe that's a better way to say it. Um, somebody asked me about juggling uh, children and work and stuff like that. Would you ask a man that? Would you ask? You know, I was I was the person in a pub who, if you pulled your peanuts off the topless woman, do you remember those? Oh, oh fucking hell, behind yeah. the behind they the had bar. them in the gate in Northwood. I remember. You know, it. Yeah. If I saw them, I'd be absolutely furious and want yeah. to speak to the you know the barman. And say, no, I'll have crisps that. instead. So I was ready for a fight. I'd you know, <coughs> had my dukes up, yeah. ready at all times. So I've got a feeling. You know, this isn't the first time people have been outraged, and in a way, the the collateral damage or the teething problems of change are these spiky moments. But I'm all for the spiky moments. That's where, that is where all the learning is. It it really is. But I can't be forced into a corner and yet I am in one. I don't know how to get out of it. I think we all feel that at yeah. the moment. Unless, like you say, you're ready to put yourself above the parapet and go, right, bring it on. And it's, that's a big big thing to do it's well then life you wouldn't changing. get any other work done no no, uh, no that will become who you are now yeah you know yeah. Your, your cause if you like yeah so you better really it better be a real cause that you are prepared for everything in your life to be uh Screwed. subliminated underneath yeah completely it's utterly bonkers but like you just said what we're what we're missing out on when we either don't look at our mistakes or we're intolerant of other people's mistakes is the learning we're not learning 
probably very much at all from the good moments, the happy moments, the perfect moments. They're lovely and they feel fantastic. Yeah. But the learning is when you're on your knees. The learning is when you've looked back and you're cringing and you can't bear it. That's yeah. when you make a decision to go, well, I won't do that again. Yeah. Or maybe I'll learn a bit more about this or that or whatever. That's the good stuff. It is. And look, we know because we've got kids, they're going to make mistakes. Of course they are. They're, they're supposed to. But that's when it's worrying. If if your kid makes a mistake and repeats it and repeats it and repeats it, especially if it's if it hurts them or gives them shame or embarrassment or humiliation or any of those awful things, then then you have to worry. It's if if you make the mistake and even if you make it again, but then you move on or then you learn from it, hooray for those mistakes. I'm not sure what you learn from success. Not very much at all. What I would say is I have seen increasingly in the last few years people with a lot of whatever success is, you know, wealth, I don't know what it looks like. I don't ever really entirely buy it. But people who have a lot of that feeling spiritually and emotionally bereft. Yep. Because somehow that part of their life, which looks all marvellous and seems to be all tied up, means this part has been neglected. So what is success and what is the point of it all? I'd much rather live in a in the place I am, which is lucky, which is a bit awkward, bit wrong, bit ugly, bit didn't feel right, got the wrong thing, got wore the wrong yeah. clothes, <laughs> uh, said the wrong thing, regret that. You know, constant, fussy, difficult, awkward stuff. Uh, it is exhausting, yeah. but it's truthful. It's, it's being truthful. a human. <laughs> it is. Just it being is. a human. We're expecting humans to not be humans. We're expecting them to be shiny, perfect. Robos yeah, and walk are. around. Everything is perfect. Yeah, life especially is so when you messy. present it yourself. Uh, uh, I mean, I know it's an old chestnut to blame social media, but I wish social media was full of lots of ugly, difficult, funny stuff. I wish you and there is some of that. There is a, that's what I I certainly cleave towards all that stuff. But but there's also far too much of uh, aren't I perfect in this? I'm, don't I? I went to this clever thing and I'm marvelous. You know, there's that. Which and I don't begrudge anybody any of that. But, but it's but not please real. Put your other stuff on. But it's not real at all. I don't. I don't think it's even one percent of the reality of what they're experiencing in that moment. If it's yeah. a picture of them looking perfect in an outfit or whatever it might be. Yeah. And we all could go, and I think m many of us do. Oh God, they've got all their shits together, and their life is so perfect. <laughs> yeah. And yes. I'm, you know, my cat's just done a massive shit, yes. and the kid's doing this, and you're yes. just sort of stressing. Yes, it means nothing. But we're sort of buying into it, and I think that's one of the reasons the margin for error has got so small. Yes, and why I was so relieved. It's like this reading this book is a liberation of and like a relief. Like, oh God, yeah, yeah. We're, we're all doing it. We're and all doing it. Actually, it helped me turn some moments that I would have gone, oh, I'm not looking at that into funny cringe yeah so one yeah. thing that came up was and there's stuff that I had buried and it's not even big stuff especially the work stuff because you have some hilarious work moments in there there was a time where obviously I was sort of like a fetus on the tv trying to present a tv show with a huge amounts of naivety and cockiness and everything that comes with being a teenager I remember being a teenager and having to go into one of those awful film junkets where a Celebrity sits there and they're just bombarded with questions all day. And it was Brad Pitt. And I thought, I'm going to cheer his day up. Whilst I'm interviewing him, I'm going to get him... I mean, this is so cringe to admit. <laughs> You're in a safe space I thought this was OK then. to do. You're safe. I'm going to get him to draw me and I'm going to draw him whilst I interview him. OK. He, correct. His face literally dropped. It was like his heart sunk. It was like he was ready just to go, do you know what, guys, I'm done. I've We've done 80 of these and she's the final straw. <laughs> she's the worst. I'm out. And I think he literally drew like the shittest sort of stick person. Like, I was really getting into it and it was just the cringe. And I, I thought I could never repeat that to anyone. I'm a professional. I'm really good at interviewing. I've always been good at interviewing. What a load of absolute bollocks. Yeah. I've had so and many awful young. interviews. I was... 16, 17. I've done so many awful interviews. I've got people's names wrong. I've said stupid things. Like, I've done all the stuff that you don't want to admit, but it's part of who I am. And it's actually, it's the stuff that I've, I've learned. Oh, I'm never going to, you're not drawing me right now. Do you know what I mean? I've no, learned not to I will, do that again. If you want me to, no, I will. I've, I've if you want to work through it, terrible idea. <laughs> um, but, you, but you learn, and we're all a, 
a melting pot of all of these mistakes and yeah. cringy things and and you know, I think the shame thing is big because I do think there is a difference between that sort of embarrassment and to shame. And I think yeah. shame is where regret can come in. Yeah. Now you say, and it's on the front cover of your book, a yeah. life of mistakes, no regrets. I'm trying. That's what I aspire towards, no regret. What do you think helps get you to that place of no uh, regret? Owning everything, but honestly, 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 uh, owning stuff where you've fucked up, you know, and when you were resentful, spiteful, harbouring anger, you know, all these things which, again, all, all human um, and all forgivable, but more difficult to forgive when you've you know really been spiky for no reason or when you've decided that 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 person who upset you you're gonna hang on to it and you're gonna punish them for it forever and it's gonna puss up and become a great big thing and you only define them by that awful thing they said to you in other words all the rules you'd like to have applied to you all the forgiveness and the kindness you'd like to apply you you must learn to do it back and not because we slightly enjoy this. Mm. There's, some, there's an enjoyment in sulking. There's an enjoyment in resentment. So it's a course of, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. I think if someone is unkind to you or someone is an unkind person, yeah, you have to recognise that. Yeah. You have to know what it is and you have to make sure you dodge it. And there's always a way to dodge stuff. And you might have to remember that of that person so that you dodge them yeah if you think again their intent is not has no valor in it or no goodness in it then of course you, that's your survival you must dodge that but just because someone hurt your feelings isn't a reason to carry it as a weapon you know and the weapon is it, the only person carrying the heavy weapon is you yeah you know and it is heavy and you're carrying it just in case you see that person, you can shoot them down. <laughs> and you kind of you know, want to see them. So yeah, you can... but who's suffering? <laughs> who's suffering? Yeah. You know, that's why forgiveness is like the biggest gift of all and so hard to do. I mean, you know, I, when I think about the massive forgivenesses of history, people who've been persecuted, who have to forgive the people, I have no idea how somebody does that, although I know you have to. To have your own life or to regain anything. I know it's the right thing. I don't know how... Uh, some people climb a mountain that is so huge that I couldn't possibly begin to imagine it. But we're all climbing some mountains, however big or small in our lives. And sometimes our personal little mountain is one that is huge to us. Yeah. And it might mean that I might just have to say to my auntie or whoever... um. You know, that thing you say when I was 13, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which hurt me in the way that that teacher hurt you. Uh, it's gone now. It's gone. And, you know, yep. I know that you're an OK person, sort of. Um, and you, and you, uh, I want you to know that that hurt me then. Yeah. But it's gone now. And let's hug it out. You know, it feels so much better, doesn't it? And how, but how do you feel forgiving yourself? Because I think we have a very hard time doing that. That can maybe be harder than forgiving others well you have to own it first and that's the really difficult thing because i think we also it's very important that we work out who we are you know you work out what your politics are and you do that you make mistakes doing that you know that that's kind of what college or university or those years of your life uh, that's what I think further education is about, actually, essentially about that. It's about being an, a total twat, uh, you know, <laughs> sleeping with all the wrong people, yep. getting the wrong politics, taking up the wrong hobby, uh, voicing yourself in a certain way, wearing the wrong clothes, doing, you know, doing everything wrong yep. so that you can work out who your mates are, who you who you are attached to, who you think is wise, who think who you think is clever, what you think is right or wrong. That's really what all of that timing is about. So then we have a picture of who we are. And what you've got to be careful of is that you don't get entrenched in that so that you never change. Yeah. And that is a difficult thing to do because you have principles. And, you know, my parents had principles and I know that I lived by their principles, their moral compass, if you like, for quite a long time until I realised that some of them weren't quite what I really felt or maybe were in set in another time mm, and we might need to adjust or 
work out. And that's why when the person said to me, catch up, Dawn, that spoke to all of that for me. I thought, oh, oh, I'm stuck in amber in this weird time. I'm part of the problem here. I need to catch up. I need to catch up. And it wasn't until afterwards that I thought, just give me a chance to catch up. Yeah, but also... The willing is there. I, I find it really problematic because there'll be so many other issues that that particular person doesn't know about and that's okay there'll be there could be things in other areas whether it's to do with animal cruelty or race or whatever that they don't know about so we're all trying and we're all learning I think to sort of blame or shame or point out when someone isn't up to scratch I just don't think it's helpful I, I agree I agree although I have had people in my life where you know, I have people around me, older people maybe, who might use terminology that yes. I find difficult. Problematic, yes. And yes, so yes. Uh, that's when I think, right, time to plug into all the tolerance I've got and to say, by the way, just saying carefully, gently, uh, with no blame, that we don't say that anymore. Yeah. And uh, this is my mixed race daughter and we don't refer to her. And those terms, and nobody does anymore. It's a bit kind of done. And for those people to go, oh, I see, oh, I see. And they're a little bit annoyed that you might have even said it because you're calling them out, yep. however gently. But then they continue to do it. Hmm. So this is where you have to make some decisions. This is older people. Um, and somehow they've hunkered down into their their lexicon, their terminology, what they always thought was right, their mother thought that was right, they thought they don't want you to tell uh, tell them how to be. And is the is the fight worth it with someone who is not just that, 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 that is not the whole person. The whole person is many other kind, yes. marvellous things with this little hole where they're doing something a bit offensive to me more than a bit offensive mm. and they won't listen to me they don't want to listen and possibly they are hunkered back into their into their opinions and they don't want to be flushed out or yeah. it was embarrassing to find it out and the embarrassment is too much it's, yeah. it's trapped them somehow so I'm going to have to wrap my understanding around that and it's many layers but this is it all of this is so nuanced and that's why it's problematic when it's like you're wrong done yeah because it's it's not like that no. there's it's all so nuanced it and is. due to myriad of things yeah. and i think that's why your backstop has to be i bet this is a nice person really yeah or what's happened here what's happened i mean you know my husband runs um what i would call a rehab he he doesn't refer to it as that actually but he just says you know he helps people that are in a bit of a pickle and he constantly reminds me that lots of the people that are in a pickle with alcohol or drugs or whatever it might be eating whatever it might be in life there's a reason why these things have happened and there might be reasons that i couldn't even begin to understand so it's not for me to do the judging of why somebody is in the pickle I I may not like what they do when they're in a pickle and I've got a right to to have my boundaries when it comes to, you know, if you're going to be drunk, you don't look after a kitten or a baby yeah. or whatever it might be. You know, you don't do that. Um, but uh, but I also have to try and understand what their particular mountain might be that got them to that place. And if that person manages to go for a month without resorting to these things that have become their crutches forever. That's a giant mountain. But it's tiny to me mm-hmm. because I'm I'm not in that problem. I'm I'm not I'm not at the bottom of that giant mountain. I'm already halfway up there. And I started halfway up there because I haven't had all the trauma or all the whatever it was that drove you to that place. And sometimes it won't be even a big um, physical trauma that happened to you often is, but sometimes it won't be that. It'll be a gnawing, eroding of your confidence or an unlovedness or whatever it might be that I have no experience of. So I don't have a right to judge it, but I do have a duty to respect it. But you have to, that means you've got to wrap around every person Instead of regarding everyone, as I say, on that level playing field of either you're a good person, you're a bad person, you're managing, you're not managing, which is what we all do very quickly when we judge somebody, um, you know, on first sight. 
you, you know, instead you think, what is it? What's got you to that? Why, why, why are you doing that? Why are you being so spiky? Older person in my life using inappropriate language. What's going on here? You know, and sometimes if you just wait a little while, just wait a little while, it comes back round and they will capitulate or they will give in or you find suddenly there's a moment when they don't use that terminology when they could have you think yay victory yes. victory victory and that's i've got to apply that to myself yes. as well that's hard yeah but because we, you don't know what your offenses are no no until no. somebody tells you and we, we we've all got blind spots we're all gonna have someone out there that we don't understand and we're not actually sure how we're offending or why we're offending, but we have, and we need to look at that. And Well, the irony, of course, is that your blind spots are always your beloveds. Yeah. So in a funny way, they're the very people that you should be taking to that you're safe to do so, that it's your job to do if you're a mother or a sister or a daughter or whatever it is. These are the people that you should be able to uh, talk openly with. But they are also the ones that you forgive much more quickly than anything. Mm. And also it suits you not to see it. Mm. It suits you not to see that fault because that happens to be somebody in your family or that happens to be someone you adore. And you just it's just too difficult to admit yeah. there, you know, that there's this big difficult area to have to deal with in the long run. I mean, so much of this boils down to empathy, doesn't it? When, when we're looking at mistakes, whether it's feeling that self-compassion for ourselves or having the empathy to forgive and move on witnessing other people's empathy. Yeah. It feels like we've got a bit of a collective empathy deficit going on. Yeah, like that's what we're experiencing. I agree. And I don't know how to change that. No. We, I, I don't know how to change it. We, and we're going to have to raise our kids, our grandkids, all of them, um, with more confidence than this. They're going to have to be braver than us. I don't it's know a tricky how to one, do isn't that. it? Because we don't want them to have to have a suit of armour on to go out into the world, but we do want them to not feel silenced yeah, or to feel like they can't silence. speak and their always minds. always question. Yeah. You know, always question. But, but, but you've got to be allowed to question without it being regarded as an ignorance. Yep. Yep. God, it's complicated, but it's utterly... <laughs> it is. Complicated. It but is. don't forget the fun. Oh, it's of, so you know, that, fun. That's the only thing <clears throat> that I can... That is a constant in my life is that of every difficult thing and certainly every mistake, there's the flip side of it where you go, I can't believe this is who I was in that particular occasion. <laughs> I can't believe I had a crush on this person oh, and said do you those know things. The story oh. that made me laugh out loud and then yes. I had to go and read it to my husband yeah. was when you went to the panto with Jennifer yeah. and you weren't in on the joke <laughs> yeah. that everybody else everybody else knew got do you want me to tell the story? Please. So I went to a panto um, and we were we went to see a friend of ours. We were, I don't know, I think we'd only just started where we must have been about 23, 24 and we were sitting in the middle of a row and our lovely friend Gareth was singing. He was Prince Charming. It was marvellous. Um, and the um, buttons came on and were announced that there was going to be uh, a prize for whoever had the winning magic number on the back of their programme. And I've never won a prize. And that that mitigates my story a bit. I've never <laughs> won a prize. Um, and what's more, he then held up the prize, which was a giant troll. Those kind of trolls that you stick on top of a pencil. Love to troll. I collected those yep. in all colours of hair. Uh, that this was giant. I mean, I really wanted it. Wanted it more than any... 23 year old <laughs> um, but really wanted it so very interested in that buttons comes on he, and he puts his hand in the bucket to take out the random winning number and he announced that the number was number 13 and I was I had number 13 I could not believe it finally finally I had won something so I just pushed everybody else out of the way in my row I can see it now she, you know <laughs> scraping my knees past her get out of the way I'm the winner I'm the winner getting out into the aisle and he even Jennifer trying to pull me back. And I just thought, oh, she wants it. She's not having it. So I just went, I got to the aisle and I started a little victory trot all the way down to the front. And there was this kind of noise going on all around me. And I, I mistook that noise for a kind of them goading me Hysteria on, like, you know, celebrating the champion. And I got to the stage, got all the way to the stage. <laughs> so I got from the back of the theatre down to the front. Ugh. And um, <laughs> and he whispers, whispering something to me. And I was going, what, what? What? I can't Just hear you. the troll. Because of all this laughing that was going on, that should have been the first red flag. And he said to me, everyone's got number 13. It's a joke. And I was the only person in the whole theatre that had not got the joke. 
Oh. And there were people who had dementia there and they <laughs> they got the joke and I did not get the joke. <laughs> the humiliation of it, awful. But what's great is I tell the audience the story and they oh, know what that feels like. Maybe the they best. never were quite as twatty as me. <laughs> but, but they feel for me in my twattiness because the walk back to my seat, honestly, oh, took the about 20 years. About 20 years. It took two seconds to run down. Without the troll. Didn't get the troll. Didn't get the troll. Wanted it outrageous. so badly. Why is the word twat so good? It's like the bit sounds so Do you know, it seems to have perfect. offended a lot of people. Really? Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I know that it can <laughs> refer to genitals. And it doesn't to me. To me, it's a gentle, a sort of a slap with a hug. It's you know, the it's funniest like that, word. It? And if I say to you, oh, friend, stop being such a twat. Yeah, I'm like, Do okay. you want me to tell you when you were a twat? <laughs> Look at your face. Her face has changed now. I saw the most wonderful twatty thing you did, and it was just yesterday. And I love you. Yesterday? I love you so much for this. I can't. Oh, my goodness. Oh. I love you so much for this. Please have that hug first. So you, in all your kindness and your generosity, which is huge with you, she's looking at me over the top of her, of her book. She's so afraid. <laughs> I've got so much power at this moment. Um... You, you, with all your kindness, decided to put on your Insta stories how yeah. much you love this book. Yeah. So this is how it went. You hold up the book and you say, can I just say that this book is... Oh, look at my eyebrows. God, I've, got, I've put far too much. I've done something to my eyebrows. I don't know what I've done. I've put too much on there. Anyway, yeah, I don't. must be careful not to do that. Anyway, anyway, this book... <laughs> what what? In the middle of praising the book, <laughs> you noticed something about yourself, like we all do, and thought, oh, look at that. I'll have a little moment of thinking about that. And then, anyway, back to the business. <laughs> Marvelously twatty in every way. I'd used a new. <laughs> Normally, I use an eyebrow pencil and I use like a, a brush with. <laughs> <laughs> we were like eyebrow dye and they were just very um, there <laughs> but I loved it in the middle of the thing and never a moment of you thinking oh I better, I better, I better talk edit that <laughs> or I'll just redo it no just carry on just carry on it doesn't matter <laughs> but that's real twat. you that is real you being what a real giant person twat. Oh. giant respect for that look I'm going to be a twat every day from now until the day I die yeah. hooray to that yeah Dawn. agree Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank My you for writing the book. Pleasure. It's the biggest relief and it was so lovely to talk to you today. Lovely thank to you. be with you for any time. <laughs>